Tom Pelissero's here, everybody. Tommy P, everyone. Hey. How are you, Tom? Can you hear me? We're good? I hear you, Rich. Yeah, What's so... up to my boys in the studio? Hey, Tommy, Tommy P. P. Tommy, Tommy P, P. P. New, new home studio? Is that, is that what this is? Oh, okay. It, it is the new home studio, nice. although the backdrop is the exact same one. Just the lighting is a little bit better. Oh. I've been told if I don't shave, it becomes very apparent that I have not shaved. And oh. so it's actually improved uh, my grooming habits as well as the look <laughs> of the shot. Well, I mean, anyway, listen, I know you, you uh, compete with Adam Schefter for information um, and being first and things of that nature and accuracy. Now you're competing with uh, him in terms of uh, information men for whom it's obvious they haven't shaved. You know, I mean, that's... <laughs> He's up there, but although although Schefter's uh, uh, shave line starts right under his eyelid, <laughs> right? right. Under I don't have I don't have that curse of like the full um, you know werewolf beard uh, yeah, that pops true. up every night, which yeah. is why I was so surprised the first time that I showed up on Good Morning Football without having shaved, and I was asked, "Are you growing a goatee?" Oh. So this is, I mean, fantastic work by uh, <laughs> by all the folks back there, Mike Cunningham yeah. and uh, John Bonacorso that. and everybody who built this studio. Look there. It's really, you. really a sensational setup. Giving shout outs. Rich, also, Adam doesn't have the camera angles that Tom has. You, well, you, you I, I worked on that with him. I don't know. To, I've tried. But then the next time it know, was bad again. So. I tried. Uh, Tom, let's jump into it here. Is, is, is now Cooper Cup uh, off of uh, – or – he, was he ever on a trade block, or or, or is now uh, Leslie is Les Snead going to have uh, blocked calls for him? Tom, what do we have? I mean, last night figured as a really big game. If the Rams lose, if maybe there's a flag thrown for a face mask, if the Vikings drive for a touchdown, maybe we're in a little bit different spot. I think that you you saw what the Rams thought that they had coming into the season, which was if they have Cup on the field, if they have Puka on the field, and obviously Matthew Stafford they still can create a, a lot of mismatches and they've got a, a really efficient type of an offense. Uh, and you witnessed that last night, despite extraordinarily maybe unprecedented limited practice for Puka Nakua. And then obviously Cooper cup coming off of a uh, five, six week layoff himself. Uh, here's what I would tell you on the trade front. The Rams had been engaged in trade calls in really over the past couple of weeks here. Certainly, it had gotten to the point of other teams being aware of what the potential compensation would be in a trade. The Rams wanting something in the neighborhood of a second round pick, maybe a little bit more for Cooper Cup. That's above the price level that we're seeing with a lot of these other trades because Devontae Adams was basically a third round pick. Amari Cooper was a little bit less all told than a third round pick. DeAndre Hopkins was a fifth. That's that's kind of the bandwidth you normally see with these trades when you're talking about in the season. Um, you know, the last guy I think that got traded for a second round pick was Chase Claypool, which is an entirely other conversation. Mm. But Cooper Cup's, you know, 31 years old and he's been hurt three years in a row. It's hard to sit there as, as another team and say, we're going to give up a second round pick and maybe more for the guy. So it never advanced to the point of, this is about to get done, but certainly, you know, they had those trade conversations. You watch it last night, you look at the state of the NFC West and you, you kind of get that sense. I'm sure Sean McVay had it of like, why can't we make a run? They, they may need to add, you know, they're in, and this is part of the one function of the later trade deadline. This is the first year that has been pushed back even another week. And you have teams like the Rams who might have thought were out of it. And all of a sudden now you're going, do we need to be buyers instead? That's that's why the advisory committee had advocated for either a week, if not two additional weeks to the trade deadline, which was just get more information about what type of team you are so you can decide which side of the fence you're on. Flip side of that, the reason the competition committee always had pumped the brakes on putting a later trade deadline is you don't want teams to really know they're bad and go total fire sale and impact competitive balance and impact the matchups that happen the back half of the year. But to the extent that everybody loves trades, we've had a half dozen of them so far. I would fairly guess if I had to put it over under on, we'll probably have a half dozen more over these next uh, couple of weeks here. It's entertaining, and you're going to continue to get action as teams kind of try to figure out which side of this they're on. Tom Pelissero here on the Rich Eisen Show. So no Jaden Daniels when the media is out there. And then uh, the media meets with Coach Quinn, and he's like, oh, yeah, uh, we put him out there, and we pushed it pretty hard, too. And he's now designated as limited going into this Sunday game, highly anticipated against the Bears and the guy drafted right in front of him in Caleb Williams. What's your reporting on Jaden Daniels' ability to be available for that one? 
When you're talking about a rib injury, Rich, and it's not a you know a broken rib, you're talking about something a little bit more nuanced here. A lot of it is just about functionality. It's about can he go out there? Can he make the types of movement he needs to? And so the commander's approach all week was, let's see if we can get him on the practice field on Friday. Let's see how his body responds. And then let's try to push it. Um, Dan Quinn said it today. You know, they'll see how he feels over these next 48 hours which basically makes it a game time type decision. I believe the commanders will have a very good idea by tomorrow morning what direction this is going to go. You always want to be careful when you're talking about young quarterbacks and putting them out on the field when they haven't had a whole lot of work through the practice week here. But it still might be, Rich, a little bit early to kind of crystal ball it. You'd probably say just based on the reps through the week that Marcus Mariota is more likely to start this game. But, I, I you know, the commanders have not ruled out Jaden Daniels. I wouldn't totally rule that out just yet, especially because you know that guy's going to want to be on the field and he's going to be pushing to play. And so who is going to be playing in Dallas at San Francisco? A lot of bold face names that are either expected to miss and are hoping to come back in time to go on Sunday night. Run it down for me, Tom. Well, I know the Cowboys had been optimistic that Micah Parsons would get back for this game. Not practicing the first couple of days of the week isn't necessarily a great omen for that. So, you know, to keep an eye on the participation today to see whether or not he's going to be able to go. On the flip side of it, you know, the 49ers aren't going to shed any tears for the Cowboys having a few injuries because it's unbelievable. I mean, it's basically their entire team. Obviously, Brandon Ayuk is out for the season uh, with the torn ACL and MCL. Debo was in the hospital for a night or two with uh, something resembling pneumonia. He got released, was back in the practice field yesterday. Sounds like he's tracking to play in the game. McCaffrey still, um, you know, the target really over the last month here has been getting back after this week's bye. So I believe it's November 10th would be his uh, potential return date. Jordan Mason's been banged up, but you know, he played last week. Seems like he's going to be okay to go. George Kittle got back onto the field, at least on a limited basis yesterday. It, there's probably going to be a lot of guys listed as questionable for this game, Rich. It seems like, though, you know, in terms of the most concerning ones like Debo you know, last week, I mean, I, there's not a lot of examples I can think of where a guy has fluid in his lungs and is struggling to breathe and he's active on game day and has mm. to drop out. You know, the fact that he was hospitalized for this, you know, it's a, it's a scary type of a situation, but certainly seems like Debo's, um, you know, charting a, a good course to be back on the field. And they're going to need him because I forgot to mention Juwan Jennings, who I know they were optimistic going into the week he might be back. No practice for him Wednesday or Thursday. Now sounds like he's doubtful to go. And Kittle's been limited with a foot injury. Is he going to go? Is he expected to go Sunday night? Tom? It's a foot sprain. Got back on the field yesterday. Um, seems like it's headed a good direction. You know, he's... I feel like Kittle's been questionable for about half the games this year. Most right. of the time he's played. So, you know, tough dude. He's going to push himself to be out there. But another one where you just kind of got to see how does he, his body respond here over these next 24 hours before they make a final call. And now, I don't know if you know the answer to this. I'll ask it anyway. Tua's been named the starter. It's official. He's back. Why, why no guardian cap for him? Do you know anything about his thought process on this subject matter? Tom? Well, part of it is, Rich, that the NFL through their programs has invested a lot of money into programs to basically fund the development of position-specific helmets and safer helmets. Every year they put out that, you know, that list from the safest helmet to the least safe helmet, and those ones down there in the danger zone are kind of cycled out. You have a final year, you can still wear that helmet, which based on where we are with technology, it always surprises me that some guys who choose to be grandfathered in and there, there are some of the newer position-specific position helmets that are actually safer than a normal helmet with a Guardian cap on top of it. So that's part of the reason you haven't seen as many Guardian caps. I think there's only maybe a half dozen or a dozen players that have worn them this year with Tua, again, because you've had that development. And you know, to give you like the short version of it, obviously materials get better, um, but there is also a mechanical aspect to this, an engineering aspect to it, where you'll see now some of the offensive linemen, for instance, they have these big things up in the front of the helmet. That's because a lot of the helmet, the head contact they get it's in a headbutt situation right as the ball is snapped each time. With quarterbacks, it's some of the padding um, and the different things they do around the back of the helmet, the side of the helmet, because that's how quarterbacks a lot of times um, are hitting their heads. And so it, it's probably not a, a huge surprise. I think that, you know, listening to Tua, he was obviously very passionate about why he's getting back onto the field. Um, this was, you know, tracking this direction over the last couple of weeks that he was going to be back on the field. You know, the key things, and the Dolphins emphasized this today, is that 
He consulted leading specialists, medical experts around the country. Nobody told him that it's not safe or recommended you retire from football. He mm. made his decision in concert with his doctors as well as with his family. He wants to be on the field. He was cleared by the independent neurologist uh, yesterday after practice. Um, you know, Mike McDaniel's got to, as we talked about last week, Rich, he's got to bear that burden of once again, you know, he's coaching a quarterback who he can't get hit. You can't call the types of plays that other coordinators can where it's all right. Every now and then you take, you know, you get blasted by a free rusher. You got to stand in and make the throw. They can't do that with Tua. I'm sure they're going to have a really good plan for him. Everything that I've heard is in practice. Now, these are, you know, you don't touch the quarterback in practice, but non-contact during this week, Tua is ripping the ball all over the field. He's hitting bombs. The Tyree kill is a little bit banged up too, but it sounds like he's going to be able to go uh, this week. Tua looks like Tua in practice. They've obviously got to keep him upright. He's got to keep himself out of harm's way, but he's going to be back out there, and we'll see You know how quickly he hit the ground running against the Cardinals. Tom Pelissero, my colleague from the NFL Network, NFL Media Group here on the Rich Eisen Show. Your chatter with anybody from Kansas City about DeAndre Hopkins, the amount uh, will see him, and how they think uh, they can use him how he will fit anything uh, open your reporter's book on on deandre hopkins joining the two-time defending kansas city chief super well, bowl what's fascinating champs. about this one rich is you know it had been this is one that had been percolating basically for over a year because deandre hopkins had a lot of talks with the uh, chiefs after he got released by the cardinals prior to signing with the titans about potential there the titans were able to step up with an offer um mike vrabel is a guy that he was familiar with he chose tennessee obviously vrabel is no longer there the titans are going into a rebuilding uh, type of a phase right now even though they're still trying to win but the chiefs see a guy you know i had one gm say this to me this week when talking about um you know some of the other wide receivers who are potentially available and he said you know i'd rather have hopkins than a lot of these guys because he can still run Hop has dealt with some injuries. He had another one in camp this year, missed about four weeks of action. But, you know, his, he's a freaky athlete now. He can move, and they've lost so many guys in that Chiefs wide receiver core that it makes a lot of sense. I mean, when you think back uh, through the course of this season, obviously Rasheed Rice was their leading receiver. He's lost uh, for the rest of the season. You have Juju now who gets banged up. He was a guy that they brought in to help fill some of the gaps he's out. Mecole Hardman's out. This puts Sky Moore on injured reserve. I mean, that's if you were charting their depth chart, if you toss Juju in there, that's like four of your top six or seven receivers. They just need, you know, functional bodies. You know, with Hopkins, he's never been, I'll say this as kindly as I can, he's never been a big practice player. He prefers to play in games. I would imagine that they're going to put him through the paces, make sure that he knows enough of the playbook that he can get out there and give him something. Andy Reid said it himself. Why wait? You know, I, I think they saying he's going to play 70 snaps is probably a little bit aggressive here, but I wouldn't be surprised at all, even though it's a really hard position to join midstream, get the rhythm and timing and tempo that's so critical to NFL passing offenses. I would not be surprised at all if you see Hopkins play a good chunk of snaps right out of the gate. I also would be surprised if they keep on, uh, you know, keep on at the in the trade market, right? I mean, um, that this would not be the only thing they do. Because, I mean, you're right there. You're 6-0. and You're in the middle of your potential first-ever three-peat season. It strikes me that they'll be aggressive. The Eagles are always aggressive. You've got that. I'm, I'm wondering how the, this trade market is shaping up. Uh, election Day, we all talk about, that's 10 days away or 11 days away right now. That's the trade deadline day. So you can utilize that as sort of your, your football mentality as well. How is this shaping up in your mind, Tom? Well, for the Chiefs, definitely they're they're going to continue to be in the market. You know, if it makes sense for them, they're not going to go out and you know blow all their future draft picks. But if there's something that makes sense, absolutely. Brett Veach has shown that over the course of time that he's willing to do it. You know, another corner would be a potential uh, thing that the Chiefs could target here. Obviously, trade away Legereus Sneed in the off season. They could probably use at minimum some depth at that position um depending on what keeps happening with the wide receivers you know could they go out and add another wide receiver i don't know that it's going to be another big name type of a guy you know i think that the chiefs were kind of the boogeyman for everybody who was shopping a wide receiver in recent weeks it was like hey the chiefs might come get him if you don't step up and, right. and make this they make the the trade for hopkins that probably settles a little bit 
But again, with all their injuries, um, you know, that wouldn't totally shock me. In terms of some other teams that are going to be in that market, I would certainly tell you that the Pittsburgh Steelers have been, you know, involved on every wide receiver trade talk that's happened uh, so far this season. Now the Russell Wilson's in the lineup. That passing game is probably going to get opened up uh, a little bit more here. You saw how that unlocked George Pickens last week. I certainly believe, you know, they're not going to they're not going to go and and you know bust the bank either to go out and get somebody. But if there's you know the right opportunity, absolutely they're going to be in that mix. I know John Lynch was on the radio today saying he thinks that they've got plenty at wide receiver. But you know, let's be honest, Kyle Shanahan, a former wide receiver, he thrives on getting people open. We'll see how Ricky Pearsall continues to develop. But if the right guy becomes available at the wide receiver position. Would not shock me if San Francisco was involved in that. But the Bucks losing Chris Godwin and not having Mike Evans for the next four weeks, that's another team. You know, I don't see them making the huge move, but could they make a move at that position? Um, absolutely, I think that's the case. You know, some of the other layers to this trade deadline are if you zoom out and think some of the big picture things uh, with various teams. For instance, the Browns and the Raiders both lost a quarterback this week. The Browns, of course, lost to Sean Watson. Dorian Thompson Robson's also banged up. But then the Raiders put Aiden O'Connell on IR with a thumb injury that's going to keep him out uh, for four to six weeks here. Neither, I think it's fair to say neither of those teams are 100% confident or should be 100% confident that they've got the long-term answer on their roster. You know, the Raiders, it's it's Aiden O'Connell and it's Gardner Minshew. I, I think they're realistically, you know, they have Desmond Ritter, who they just added, signed him off the Arizona practice squad. I think realistically, they're going to be in the in the quarterback mix in 2025. The Browns, even though they're committed for another two years, 92 million to Deshaun Watson. Mm. You know, I, my sense is with the way that he was playing, the way that he was struggling, how inefficient they were offensively and in the passing game, that the Browns are probably going to have to look into the quarterback market in 2025, regardless, whether it's drafting somebody, you know, if that's a high pick, a mid round pick, whether that's signing somebody else, maybe Jameis plays great down the stretch and you bring him back. But when you have those types of big picture needs, it always says to me, are there opportunities short term to go out and maybe take a shot on somebody now, instead of waiting until March, whether that is, going and try to swing a trade for Bryce Young, who the Panthers are not going to give away. He's starting this week, and, you know, you have to feel on some level for Bryce Young. He gets benched back after week two, yeah. watches Andy Dalton go out, win the first game, then they lose four in a row. Dalton's in a car accident with his family, sprains his thumb, so all of a sudden Bryce, not because the Panthers wanted to put him back on the field, but because mm. they had to put him back on the field, He's now going into Denver with no Deontay Johnson, Ugh. no Adam Thielen against the Vance Joseph defense that's Ugh. been kicking everybody's. You know, but in other words, if, if there's an opportunity there, why wouldn't you call out a Bryce Young? Why wouldn't you, you know, if you're interested in a Zach Wilson, somebody else? Um, you know, those are some of the other the, sort of the macro wow. types of things that could happen here. It's not all about. You know, the contenders, that's a big piece of it. The contenders going out and getting somebody, even if it's a lower profile move like, you know, the Seahawks. I mean, the Seahawks gave up a player and a fourth round pick for Ernest Jones. You don't see trades like that for inside linebackers, especially during the season. But they really felt like they needed an upgrade. So they were aggressive with it. You also could have some of those teams that are kind of looking already down the line 2025 going you know, if there's a buy low type of opportunity now, maybe it's worth taking a shot. And then in the couple minutes I have left, are, is it possible big name defenders are on the move? If the Browns lose, Vegas loses again. Um, you know, the, the rumor mills are red hot about Miles Garrett and Max Crosby being available for the right price, which would be very high rent district, I'm sure. But break down that in the couple minutes I have left for you, Tom. The, the theme that I have heard from talking to people around the league is for a lot of those teams that are kind of on that brink of their 2024 season being over, there's usually one guy who they're not going to move. It's kind of, <laughs> hey, look at the rest of the roster. We're not going to move that guy. The Browns, I'm not shocked by much these days, Rich. I would be shocked if they move Miles Garrett. He's just too much of a core piece to everything that they do. I do think the Browns would move a lot of other players on their roster. They already moved Amari Cooper. I would certainly anticipate they're going to get calls on guys like Zadarius Smith, um, you know, a player like Greg Newsom, who maybe potentially could be available. Um, you know, there's other guys, Elijah Moore. Could somebody call about him, the wide receiver? Um, but I don't think they're moving Miles Garrett. The Raiders, 
I mean, Max Crosby is the face of the Raiders right now. I know how close Marcus feels he is with Max Crosby. You know, Max steered them. I mean, Max was ready to demand a trade if they didn't hire Antonio Pierce to be the head coach. He's a big reason AP has that job to say, now you're going to turn around and trade Max Crosby. Not impossible, but it would surprise me. And then, you know, to throw in one more, Tennessee with Jeff Simmons. Uh, you know, they made tra- two trades this week, Hopkins and Ernest Jones. You know, Jeff Simmons is the one that I imagine they're going to get a lot of calls on. It would surprise me just because he's such a big leader. He's such a fantastic player. You know, that would send a, a message that this is a complete and total teardown here. But I think there's calls on all those guys because there's too many teams right now, whether it is a Detroit that lost Aiden Hutchinson, whether it's Dallas that's still shorthanded. There's enough teams that need edge rushers. Everybody always can use edge rush help. I think there's going to be calls on some of those big ticket items. I don't know that sitting here right now, 11 days out, I see one of those names being moved. But there's only about a dozen players, Rich, in the entire league who you can't have no matter what you offer. You offer three, three first round picks for anybody. You maybe at least can strike up a conversation. Tommy P., thank you, sir. Great stuff, as always. Thanks for making us wiser, smarter, and uh, joining us on a Friday on the Rich Eisen Show. Be well. See you soon. Appreciate it, Rich. Tom Pelissero. Follow you, him on Instagram uh, and uh, the X Machine and all that stuff. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.